From downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Say bye-bye to those mild temperatures. The real January starting to show up. We'll see how long that sticks around. Also a new front in the battle over the opioid epidemic. A Defender Special Report is one local sheriff is taking a different approach to a growing problem. But first, Ford makes a blockbuster announcement. The company's path for the future is going to ramp up right here in Flat Rock. Thanks for being with us for the News at 5. It's a surprise announcement today. Ford Motor Company says it will use the Flat Rock plant to develop and build new hybrid and electric vehicles. The intent is to put seven new electric vehicles on the road by 2020, including competition for the Chevy Volt. But the big announcement, the cancellation of a plan to build a plant in Mexico. A lot to talk about. Let's bring in business editor Rod Maloney live at Cobo, which is, of course, the home of next week's North American International Auto Show. A major shift for Ford, Rod. Uh, Devin, what a day for the entire auto industry, which is why we're here. we got so much to talk about. But let's remember back during the presidential primaries, Donald Trump really took Ford to task for its plans to build cars in Mexico. And he said he was going to fight that. Well, today, the fight ended with Ford changing its mind. CEO Mark Fields had this to say. Prompted us, obviously, to invest in Flat Rock's expansion and to cancel building a new plant in Mexico. No one saw this coming in fields, it turns out, had called President-elect Donald Trump and Vice President Mike Pence this morning to alert them. Afterward, he explained how such a shocker could come about. We've made this decision uh, on what, you know, independently on what's right for Ford, but, you know, Rob, we look at, we look at all the factors. And, you know, our view is, you know, we see a more positive U.S. manufacturing business environment uh, under President-elect Trump and the pro-growth policies and proposals that he's talking about. So this is a vote of confidence for President-elect Trump. A billion dollar one at that. Flat Rock will now expand and host an electric vehicle brain center and they'll build electrics on the assembly line here with the regular Mustangs and Continentals. 29-year line veteran Tim Hack supported Donald Trump for just this kind of chain. I'm glad to hear that Ford is, is scrapping the, uh, the plant down in Mexico. And I've decided to put the work here and, you know, it, it, it's great for America. The UAW supported Hillary Clinton and so many line workers aren't so sure about the president-elect. All we know is about making cars and you say we can make more cars, it gives us stability at work. Everybody wants job stability and that's what this does for us. So just four days or five days before the auto show, Ford's upstaging itself with a major headline. And of course, there are a lot of questions about how this all came about and what it means to the overall auto industry. Because uh, if you've read the paper today or been around the news, you know that the president elect went ahead and tweeted about General Motors and complained about them building cars in Mexico and selling them here. And so what is all going on here? What is, what is behind all of this? That is something we're gonna take a look at when we come back on Local 4 News at 5.30. Back to you. All right, Rod, you know about my, my own evangelism, of course, on the Chevy Volt. That aside, even those of us who really are excited about electric vehicles, we have to admit they have not caught on yet in a big way. So talk about the risk of this uh, plant expansion downriver. Well, it is risky with electric vehicles because there's the question of what happens to CAFE standards, which were designed yeah. specifically to force electric car construction. Well, what if American car buyers continue not buying them? Then the demand for those vehicles isn't there. And so Ford is saying, look, we think by 2020 and beyond that we'll see a lot more electric vehicles on the road. But if things change, well, they'll have to change this plan too into something else and nobody knows what that would be yeah. if in fact it's necessary. Yeah. So we'll Jarring stuff to just to contemplate uh, an electric F-150. All right, Rod, we'll talk to you again uh, coming up here at six o'clock. Big news. Now to some noticeable news coming your way. Changes in the weather starting with some rain. And after that, we know what's coming. Yeah. It's going to get cold. Let's get over to Ben now. Hi there, Ben. Hi, guys. Yes, and the cold temperatures mean that it's not going to be green. We're seeing on the radar in the next few days, but it is tonight. It will be staying all liquid, at least until we get well into the nighttime hours. Heaviest rain right now up around Saginaw and the Thumb, but you can see how that line is starting to fill in. Even down there in Livingston County, a couple light sprinkles south of Howell, south of 96. South zone, you've still got a little bit more moisture just to the south of the Ohio state line. This may start bubbling up 
uh, a little bit further north over the next few hours, but generally we'll call it scattered showers as we get through the evening hours. Temperatures dropping, but again, still staying above freezing at least through midnight tonight. There is snow on the forecast, but there is a huge drop in temperatures. We'll look at that in your four zone forecasts coming up in a few minutes. Kim. And a carjacking early this afternoon takes a very unusual twist. As men stole a man's Mercedes, they forced the victim to strip down before they took his car. Let's get out live to Priya Man with more. And Priya, this is bizarre making this poor man strip down naked. And Kimberly, talk about frightening. This man lives in the area where he was carjacked. The gunman approached the driver's side window, smashed it open, forced the driver to get out of his vehicle, and then at, gunman, at gunpoint told him to strip. It's absolutely terrifying, uh, not to mention humiliating. At gunpoint, a young man was forced to strip naked and carjacked. He was driving a 2008 Mercedes near Gratiot and Hazelwood on the east side when he approached a yield sign and started to slow down. That's when a blue minivan pulled in front of the Mercedes, came to a stop, and a passenger jumped out. Walked in front of the victim's vehicle, uh, busted out the driver's side window, pointed the weapon at him, ordered him out of the vehicle. Detroit police say the gunman forced the victim to take off his clothes, then took off in his car. The victim walked into a nearby party store and asked to call police. The carjacking happened just before noon on Tuesday. Police found the Mercedes a short time later, about a mile away near Chalmers and Cedar Grove. The carjacker crashed into a light pole and left the vehicle in an alley. Detroit police say they're seeing more cases where victims are forced to remove clothing during a robbery. We are starting to see a trend where most of our suspects are now forcing their victims to disrobe uh, as a means to determine whether or not they are armed. And when that man walked into the party store, concerned neighbors actually gave him some clothing. Thankfully, no one was injured. It's not clear why that Mercedes crashed in that alley. Detroit police at this time looking for that blue van. Reporting live, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. All right, Priya, at least three people were injured today in a crash involving a DDOT bus and multiple vehicles. Happened this afternoon, 8 Mile and Gratiot. Witnesses say an SUV sideswiped the bus before then crashing into another car. A third car was also struck. The bus driver had to be taken to the hospital and two other people were also injured. Highland Park's police chief is asking for more tips as his department continues an investigation into the case of a woman found dead in an abandoned parking structure. Yeah. Chief Chester Logan spoke to Local 4 today, refusing to confirm if a person of interest was in custody, but he did say his department is still receiving tips and still working to verify the details in the case. Each and every tip that we get, we're taking the time to, you know, to sort through it, to, to ensure that the information is accurate. Uh, and, and it takes a while. It takes a while. We've got some uh, promising things that we're looking at. So neither the victim's identity nor the cause of death have yet been released. Kim? An investigation into the cause of a deadly crash on M59 in Pontiac continues tonight. It happened during the morning rush. Oakland County Sheriff's investigators say an SUV traveling westbound on M59 at Updike crossed the median and crashed into two vehicles before catching fire. The driver in that SUV was killed. The victim's identity is not known. It's do or die. It's win or go home. It's any of those other overused cliches. When it comes to the playoffs, the Lions head to Seattle Saturday night for it, what is a very tough first round playoff matchup. And today, the team got back to work to gear up for their biggest game of the year. Jamie Edmonds is in Allen Park with more. Jamie. There's a different feel here in Allen Park. This is the playoffs. Matthew Stafford called this a total restart. Jim Caldwell says it doesn't matter how they got in. It's what they do next. Some guys are like me. They hit it in the woods and they might have to hit it between two trees in order to get on the green. But the fact of the matter is we're still on in two. All right, we're on a regulation and everybody's putting for birdie. The Lions feel thankful to be one of 12 teams still working this week, but their path won't be easy. Traveling to the NFC West champion Seahawks, where they've won their past nine home playoff games. Obviously, I have a big challenge in front of us going um, to Seattle, a team that plays traditionally extremely well at home against a really good team. And, and uh, you know, that part of it is, uh, is the challenge. you got to go out there and, and um, you know, play well against a good team. The Lions know they must be better in the second half. In their past three losses, they've been outscored 49-13. Defensively, they have to find a way to contain a very mobile Russell Wilson. Caldwell called Russell Wilson deadly. Do you agree? Um, my coach said he's deadly. He's deadly. You know, <laughs> he, he, he definitely can, uh, he definitely can uh, hurt you. 
Lions have not won an outdoor game all season. Today they did practice inside but opened up the gates to let the fresh air in. They also blasted music to try and simulate the noise at CenturyLink Field. In Allen Park, Jamie Edmonds, Local 4. All right, Jamie, Kimberly, I'm not sure if you've heard we've got the game Saturday night. Do we have you the are, game? Yes, you're, we are <laughs> your home game? for Saturday's game. <laughs> Lions take on the Seahawks in Seattle. Kickoff set for 8-15. Big one. Be excited? Indeed a big one. Yeah. All right, well, one half of the popular radio sports talk show, Valentia and Foster, Terry Foster, returned to the airwaves today. It's great to hear. That's after Foster took a break from his hosting duties, going all the way back to August to recover after suffering two strokes. Foster originally planned to return to his seat next to Mike Valeni back in October, but took more time off since he wasn't quite ready, but uh, now calls himself a new man. And we are very happy to say welcome back, yeah, Terry nice, Foster. Nice surprise having and him back. It really was. <laughs> uh, Nick Monticelli is following some troubling new developments in Frazier tonight, Nick. I'm Nick Monticelli in Fraser updating you on what's happening with the sinkhole and the repairs. Was the rain a problem as it's now standing in all these areas? And secondly, what are they doing to help people get to the businesses that could be affected by this? All right, Nick, also this selfie video being played on a loop around the world tonight. Why police say it is key to help getting a terrorist behind bars. Karen? Fighting heroin and pain pill addiction, a new year and a new way to take on the epidemic. A Defender Special Report, next. This new at six. And I'm Nick Bonacelli outside of the Wayne County Jail, where a very interesting and damning lawsuit has emerged. A deputy claiming sexual harassment against his sergeant, saying that she would say things like, what would you do right now if I were to unbutton your pants? We'll tell you the rest. All right, Nick, also man on the run, a race against the clock to find uh, this robbery suspect before he strikes again. We'll tell you who he's been targeting new at six. OK, now to a defender's special report. It's a new year and a new chapter in the fight against the heroin and prescription pain pill epidemic. Experts on the front lines of this drug problem say we need to do more to get addicts the help they need. Defender Karen Drew here with how they plan to do just that. Karen. Devin and Kimberly, this issue affects all families, all walks of life. Oakland County Sheriff Mike Bouchard, he wants to see more done to stop the prescription pain pill and heroin epidemic, and he has a new plan for the new year. It's everyone's problem. I don't care where you live, what economic strata you're in, what race, creed, religion you are, this is destroying lives everywhere. Sheriff Bouchard's deputies carry Narcan in their cars. It's a drug that can quickly reverse the effects of a heroin overdose. In over a year and a half, his officers have used Narcan 62 times, saving 59 lives. I'm staggered by that number. But right now, there is no obvious plan to staying clean for the people given Narcan. Local 4's Dr. Frank McGeorge, an emergency room doctor, says that's one of the challenges we're facing with this epidemic. And unfortunately, the problem is when we see people in the hospital, for example, with an overdose, we don't have a choice but to just discharge them. And of course, that means there's a good chance they're going to use again, which puts them at the same risk of overdose that led them to the hospital to begin with. We'd like to see some mandatory connection, um, some law that connects them with a public health, some kind of treatment, some kind of required aftercare. Sheriff Bouchard says he plans to work with the new state legislature to encourage a bill that would create a new way for addicts to get help. There has to be an aftercare. We can't arrest our way out of this and we can't Narcan our way out of it. It has to be a systemic treatment prevention community-wide effort. Sheriff Bouchard is also focused on helping addicts once they leave jail with some sort of aftercare, some sort of blocker to prevent them from getting high while they get an opportunity to get counseling and a second chance at life. He hopes to introduce that program later this year. Of course, we'll keep you posted. And even though you have that Narcan, I'm sure it just creates a whole new set of issues. It really that. does, because you feel like, oh, wow, we saved, you know, 59 of these 62 lives. That's wonderful, but there still is a much bigger epidemic bigger that epidemic. needs to be solved. Absolutely. I think we're still way behind on really grasping just how bad this is. It's happening to so many families yeah. and so many kids and people aren't That's admitting right. it. That's right. Thanks, Ken. Well, we just said hello to 2017. We've already got our first candidate announcing they're running for governor 
in 2018. A Democrat Gretchen Whitmer announced today she is going to run for the state's top office. First person to formally announce a run to succeed Governor Snyder, who will be serving is right now in the middle of his second and final term. Whitmer is 45, served as a state lawmaker since 2001, including serving in Michigan Senate and as the Senate Democratic leader. More names to follow, no doubt. Oh, but I'm sure. <laughs> almost two years away from Election yeah. Day. All right, Ben's back, and uh, we temperatures haven't been bad the past couple of days yeah, here. No, not, not at all. But, not for early January. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but that but. cliff we're going to fall <laughs> off of is coming up quick. Uh, and you can see the difference here on the map. We're at 45. You look over on the other side of the lake. Uh, those numbers right now, single numbers out in Duluth, Minneapolis uh, barely got two numbers in the temperature, 11 above. This is where the big difference is. They're anywhere between 20 and 25 degrees colder uh, compared to what we've got over here on our side of the state. We're actually slightly milder today than what we were looking at yesterday. Uh, we've still got visibility problems with that fog north of the city. We're looking at those numbers about one to two miles, especially north of eight mile, although the advisory uh, has expired uh, for dense fog. Also watching this area of showers starting to become a little bit more put together here as a cold front crosses the area. Notice that it's all rain here. We're getting some indication there could be some snow up there by Tawas. But as the cold air starts to march in tonight, there will be some switch over as we get late, most likely closer to the end of this event. As we get closer to about 11 o'clock, you could barely see it there. Tomorrow, it's just going to be a few lake effect snow showers on the back end. There will be snow to the south. In fact, this is going way south. Tennessee Valley, northern parts of uh, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia may even see some mix down there in the city of Atlanta. So I think we've kind of got the better of the uh, the ends of this bargain. But tonight's low temperatures uh, will be down into the 20s, 23 degrees right in the city of Detroit, 22 in Southfield, West Bloomfield. You'll be at 20 degrees. There will be some teens for lows. Most of those out in Lenaway County and in our west and north zones is where we'll see the coldest numbers. Uh, by the time we wake up tomorrow morning, Chelsea, you'll be at 19. How the same number and right around 20 or 21 as you get closer to 275. North zone tomorrow, at least for starts, will be in the upper teens to around 20. Warmest temperatures will be here in Port Huron and St. Clair where we'll start at 21. But there's not going to be much of a rise in temperatures tomorrow afternoon. 24 is as good as we're going to get. And with those 20 to 30 mile an hour winds, that's going to put wind chills in single numbers for tomorrow afternoon. So it is going to feel a marked difference compared to where we're at today. A couple snow showers should not amount to anything as far as accumulation goes. But tonight, as those temperatures crash, any of this rain that's left on the highways and roads could freeze uh, pretty quickly as we get into the nighttime hours. Otherwise, in the seven day forecast, temperatures don't look a whole lot different in the afternoon. They're going to stay in the 20s, lows in the teens. We do start warming up towards Monday and Tuesday, but we got a little January to go uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. next I'll five say. days. No significant snow, just a lot of cold. You're going to notice it. Yeah, <laughs> all right, Thanks, Doc. Well, it's something almost all of us do to keep clean. Head and good health, what it is and why you need to stop doing it right now. All right, Frank, but first stories from across Michigan, including the crime this guy's accused of committing while he was already in jail. Next. Welcome back, everybody. Across Michigan this Tuesday, we are following stories from Traverse City and Mackinac up north. Let's start, though, downstate in Mason, and that's where a man is set to stand trial, accused of offering two fellow inmates and an undercover police officer money to kill his ex-girlfriend. One inmate told police he offered him $2,500 to beat his ex-girlfriend to death. The offer allegedly occurred last year while the man was serving jail time for stalking that same woman. A Lansing police officer also says he was offered $2,000 to carry out the murder and then extra money to kill more people. Yeah. A new warning today for drivers who plan to travel across the Mackinac Bridge. That warning is due to high winds. Bridge officials say vehicles such as pickup trucks with campers, motor homes, and vehicles pulling trailers and enclosed semis are especially vulnerable to high winds. All drivers are asked to reduce their speed to below 20 miles per hour while driving across the bridge and also turn on four way flashers and use the outside lane. Well, this guy's taking punishment to a whole new level. Interesting dinner table conversation for this family. One father wants to press charges against his teenage daughter for using his credit card to buy a plane ticket in Traverse City, a plane ticket to Europe. 
The daughter's deceit came to light on Sunday. Police said the dad got a call from his bank about fraudulent charges. Turns out the daughter had used his credit card to buy a $1,200 plane ticket to Germany so that she could see her boyfriend. Oh. She ended up being busted just in the nick of time. TSA pulled her off the plane. She was on the plane at Cherry Capital Airport in Traverse City, oh. ready to head for Germany, but just before they took off. And now dad is pressing credit card fraud charges. Do you think she'll her. learn a lesson from all this? <laughs> my that's, goodness. That is a tough one. So many man. questions here. She's got a boyfriend in Germany. Yes. My goodness. And, and, oh. and how the TSA got wrapped up in it that's, too. That's huge. This, yeah. is, this is big. Complicated stuff. Back with more in just a minute. New at 530. Well, here we are at the GM stand at the North American International Auto Show. The trucks are still under plastic. The worst thing in the, the auto industry is uncertainty. But President-elect Trump decided to go after General Motors today, and they responded. What is this battle about? We'll tell you ahead. Deadly storms, a strong line of severe weather rips through the deep south from Texas all the way to Florida. And in Fraser, officials say that the ground continues to move. Not what we want to hear. However, there is good news to report. Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5.30 starts now. The ground is still moving. New worries tonight in Fraser as crews work around the clock on a fix that will take months. Surveyors at the site say the ground around the sinkhole in Fraser continues to move. Yeah, but as of right now, it's important to note there is no new damage. But look at this time lapse video as workers continue to try to make their progress on the bypass line. Crews are working around the clock, but that bypass is still expected to take weeks. Nick Monticelli has a look at this flurry of activity today uh, from several new issues that have popped up. Nick. Well, I'll tell you what, there's actually good news here in Frazier on a couple of different fronts. Number one, the rain that came overnight and still kind of lingering throughout the day, it wasn't a problem. They did not have to turn those drain pumps on in the Clinton River. The second piece of good news is that if you look at 15 Mile Road, they have done a great job of clearing that up so they can get more people in here. Awful scary. Awful scary. That is the impression many have when visiting this sinkhole. Those working on this project admit the ground is still moving, so the homes could collapse. This can't keep happening. You know, it's just, it needs to be pre prevented. While all of this work is just for the bypass to get around the broken sewer line, significant progress is being made. All utilities should be restored by the end of the day to the homes evacuated. 50 Mile Road has been cleaned and cleared so people can get to the businesses easier. They are considering portable air scrubbers since the area at times can smell pretty bad. Fortunately, the rain has not caused any problems and sewage did not have to be dumped into the river again. What I think that maybe they should have done maybe more investigating on what happened, maybe some more inspections. Meanwhile, locals are beginning to realize this is going to cost everyone. Rough estimates are around $100 million and their frustration is because they feel this could have been prevented. The 2004 one, that's only been 12 years. So where's the breakdown? All right, so should this earth be moving be a concern? Absolutely. In fact, they have surveyors working on it, checking two to three different times a day, but it's been gradual and slow, and they say if it can stay that way and they can stabilize it, things will be okay, but it is kind of shocking to hear that, yes, the ground is still moving. Now, a couple of late-breaking details. I just got a text message that on the 5th of this month, in a couple of days, at 5 p.m. in the Fraser City Hall, there was going to be a meeting for the residents evacuated. That meeting will talk about when they can move back in their homes and they will start talking about reimbursement for some of those homeowners. We are live tonight. Nick Monticelli, Local 4. So Nick, they avoided dumping sewage into the river last night, but that was done once before and I'm wondering if we know what kind of damage that might have created or problem that might have led to. Not just yet. They, in fact, just started testing for bacteria today. They should have those results in about 48 hours. They're optimistic it won't be too bad, but of course, Devin, they still have to worry about the physical cleanup, yeah. just getting toilet paper and things like that out yeah, of the room. Yeah, exactly right, which is a worrisome part of this for people uh, affected well beyond the sinkhole area. All right, Nick. Right. And now to the auto industry making headlines today, not just with Ford, but also with General Motors, thanks to a tweet from the president-elect. Take a look. Here's the tweet. Quote, General Motors is sending Mexico 
Mexican-made model of Chevy Cruze to U.S. car dealers, tax-free across border. Make in USA or pay big border tax. Rob Maloney is following this story tonight, and Rod GM is defending itself over this claim. Well, you know, this is amazing stuff, especially when you consider the Mary Barra is on Donald Trump's economic committee. So it's not like there isn't a relationship there, but there clearly is something much larger ongoing here. And in many ways, when you consider the timing with Ford's announcement earlier in the day today, that you get the idea that there's some gamesmanship ongoing here, much larger than we know about right now. The Trump tweet thrusts the Chevy Cruze into the spotlight and essentially puts the domestic car makers on notice. GM quickly responded in kind, though, alerting the president-elect to the facts. Quote, General Motors manufactures the Chevrolet Cruze sedan in Lordstown, Ohio. All Chevrolet Cruze sedans sold in the U.S. are built in GM's assembly plant in Lordstown, Ohio. GM builds the Chevrolet Cruze hatchback for global markets in Mexico with a small number sold in the U.S., end quote. I think it's the start of some horse trading. Auto trader analyst Michelle Krebs believes the Trump tweet came after he found out about Ford's decision to nix its plans to build a Mexico assembly plant, which also raises an important question. Are there going to be border tariffs? It may have been more if that comes into play. Ford may have saved money by not building that plant. Um, and I think a lot of automakers are going to be facing that. What, what do they do with bringing imports in from Mexico if that tax goes? There's another battle this plays into, cutting the corporate income tax to something more palatable for business. This spat drew UAW President Dennis Williams into the fray. In a statement, he said, quote, the UAW has long believed that companies that sell in our country should build their products in our country. We are proud of the quality of work in Lordstown with the cruise sedan, and we welcome Ford's flat rock announcement today, end quote. Now, Donald Trump did hit his Twitter feed again this afternoon, saying, quote, uh, instead of driving jobs and wealth away, America will become the world's great magnet for innovation and job creation. So, in essence, he's doubling down on what he said earlier about uh, General Motors. So, uh, this is no doubt going to be interesting in the days and weeks to come. Back to you. Obviously, lots of different reaction from all different sides. How's the industry reacting to the president-elect's tweets well, today? Well, I... I th we know that they're in communication. I mean, Mark Field said that he spoke with Donald Trump and the vice president-elect this morning. So they're talking to each other. They have their phone numbers. If they really need an answer, they can get one. But a lot of this is for public consumption. But one of the things that the industry would like to see is sort of the overarching picture here. What are we really looking at? What does the policy look like? Because in 140 characters, you really can't get automotive policy <laughs> down to a science here. So they want to know more, and clearly they'll get it in the weeks to come. All right. Ryan Maloney, thank you very much. More than two weeks until the inauguration today, the president-elect did prevail in a disagreement with Republican lawmakers who tried to flex their new muscle on Capitol Hill, and that's where Steve Handelsman is tonight with more. Steve. Devin, here on Capitol Hill, a lot of insiders are still saying, wait till Congress teaches Trump how Washington really works. Well, today, Trump and Twitter seem to show that Washington might be changing. Please raise your right hand. The clash came as the new Congress was sworn in after House Republicans agreed to gut an independent ethics office. Opened in 2006 after lobbyist Jack Abramoff got busted for corruption. They don't seem to get it that the country is fed up with Washington still. House Republicans scrambled, then reversed their decision when Donald Trump disapproved. The president-elect tweeted, do they really have to make weakening the ethics watchdog their number one act? Focus on tax reform, health care. House Speaker Paul Ryan promised Americans Republicans will. We hear you. We will do right by you. And we will deliver. But repealing Obamacare is complex. Trump likes parts of it. So he is committed to retaining those pieces that his advisors will say are working. Trump got a win today, Ford canceling plans for a new car plant in Mexico, as Trump demanded. Today, he threatened GM, making the U.S. or pay big border tax. The new Senate Democratic leader, New York's Chuck Schumer, warned Trump many fear a Twitter presidency. Then instead of rolling up your sleeves and forging serious policies for you, Twitter suffices. It worked for Trump on day one of the new Congress to keep Republicans in line. And Trump boasted in a retweet today that seems to be aimed in large part toward Michigan that he still is proud that he won, that he's already delivering the jobs that he promised. 
from Capitol Hill, Steve Handelsman, Local 4. All right, Steve, and some political media news to report tonight. Fox News host Megyn Kelly has announced she is leaving the cable news network for NBC. NBC says Kelly is going to anchor a new one hour daytime program and also anchor a Sunday evening news magazine show. Shakeup coming on not only for NBC, but clearly at Fox News, too. Turkish police say new video shows uh, the terrorists who gunned down dozens of people inside an Istanbul nightclub filming a selfie before the attack. In the video, the suspected gunman is seen walking down a street in Istanbul. The video is now being shown on TV around the clock in Turkey in hopes that it will lead to the man's arrest. Investigators say the suspect ditched his coat and weapons, then vanished after killing 39 people. The sentencing phase of Dylan Roof's trial will get underway tomorrow. The proceedings were scheduled to begin this morning, but the convicted Charleston church shooter requested a delay, saying he'd spent most of his time dealing with the competency hearing. On Monday, a judge found Roof competent to represent himself in the sentencing phase. He is facing the death penalty for killing nine people in a black church back in 2015. Well, the new year barely underway. Mother Nature uh, not acting very January-like mm. thus far. Ben is here to update us on those deadly storms we're seeing yeah. down south. Four people lost their lives uh, overnight. This is in far southeastern Alabama. This is near Dothan, and the video you're looking at is also from South Alabama. You can see severe wind literally throwing a large tree limb into that backyard. In addition to the tornadoes and severe wind gusts, storms produced torrential rainfall, which caused a lot of flooding. This cluster of storms started in East Texas and then carved a path across Louisiana, then right through southern Mississippi, Alabama and Georgia. Now, usually we see severe weather sort of ramp up in February and March yeah. down south. This is a tad bit early, so hopefully it's not a sign of things to come. Let's hope. Sure hope not. All right, Ben. Well, it's a meeting that was 55 years in the making. You know, right here towards the end of my life now, yeah, I would get some peace. New tonight, the emotional reunion that left everyone in tears. Also, he definitely wasn't supposed to be there. New tonight, the unusual stowaway on a flight that has police stumped. Doc? Well, it's one thing that almost everyone does to maintain good hygiene. The important reason why you should quit cleaning your ears right now. That's next in Good Health. This. New at 6. This is the Chrysler stand at the North American International Auto Show where there aren't going to be unveilings. It's uh, getting the most bang for the buck. Autonomous cars, connected car, uh, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity. So it means that the auto show has to change. And here at the North American International Auto Show, there is big change. We'll show it to you ahead. There's a proposal for a popular South Lion Orchard to be turned into a housing development, and people aren't happy about it. Hear from the owner on Local 4. All right, Coco, now to good health, earwax. We all have it. Mm -hmm. For many people, getting it out is a daily ritual. Yes, but Dr. McGeorge is here with the brand new guidelines to help everybody feel better and also understand the do's and don'ts of taking care of your ears. And that natural protection we have, we could actually be causing some pain that is exactly right, Karen and Devin. In fact, you know, here are the most common tools that I've seen patients use to remove earwax. A cotton swab, a paper clip, and a bobby pin. So let me be crystal clear, none of these should be used to clean out your ear canal for two big reasons. One, you can poke a hole in something that's really important that you might need later, and instead of removing it, you're gonna pack the wax in even tighter. Many people are compelled to clean their ears as part of their usual bathing routine because, well, let's face it, there's a yuck factor to earwax. But earwax is not dirty. It's actually a healthy thing, guarding your inner ear against dirt and other small particles. It also has antibacterial properties and it may help protect against infections. Experts with the American Academy of Otolaryngology say cleaning ears out too much can cause major problems. Excessive earwax doesn't really become a problem until it blocks the ear canal, which can cause symptoms like pain, hearing loss, itching, ringing in the ear, or even a strange little cough. If a person has symptoms, they should see a doctor to look into their ear and decide the best treatment. Now, adults who wear hearing aids are at a higher risk of building up large amount of wax because the hearing aids can pack wax in and block it from flowing out. The new guidelines suggest hearing aid users have their ear canals checked every three to six months for excessive wax. 
Now, the new guidelines also specifically address an alternative medicine technique called ear candling. Candling is a practice where a cone-shaped candle is placed in the ear, which supposedly creates a vacuum to suck out earwax. There's no evidence that this works, and it can cause damage if hot wax drips down. Now, when I see kids in the ER, it's pretty common to find some extra wax in the ear canal when I'm looking in there during a normal exam or when we're looking for an ear infection. And often, it's blocking our view of the eardrum, so we have to use a small tool to get it out of the way. It's important for parents to realize this is not something to be concerned about. It doesn't mean your child has an earwax problem. It's just a temporary inconvenience that I need to get it out of the way to see their ear And Don't you rather frequently, though, have people come into the ER who can't hear, and it's because they've got too much wax built up? This is what people are trying to get rid of on well, their own. Well, it's true. The problem is when they're trying to get rid of it on their own, they're packing it in and they're yeah. making it worse. But yes, we do actually remove a fair amount of earwax in the <laughs> ER. And I have to say, you have a tough job. Yeah. It's very yes. satisfying to get that. <laughs> Shrek yes, plug. it it's is like one of the highlights. That's of my why I won't ear. stop doing it either. The Shrek well, quit plug. Doing it. Yes, yes. Quit I, doing I, it. I have a system. You have a system. I, a system. I don't pack. Yeah, I just think you go gentle, and then you just. Yeah. Use but it. that one last yeah. one, you're like, Doctor, you oh, want to handle this I know, one, right? <laughs> I just guy. spent this time, all this time telling you. Am I the guy that ends up in the advice. ER? Yeah, you're the guy. Right, you're that guy. Me. Thanks, Doc. <laughs> Jason's here. Fill it in That's for true. sports. What no do you Bernie, no us? Jamie, although Jamie's uh, pulling double due today on her day off. She's, yeah. she's covering but things Allen in Allen Park, Park right, getting ready right. to travel with the and Lions. Big, day. big week is what it is, guys. <laughs> Forget about backing into the playoffs. It's a new season starting right now, and the Lions can silence the critics by winning its, their first playoff game since 1991's divisional round against the Cowboys. They were back on the field today in Allen Park for practice. It's another short week of preparation for the Lions and Matt Stafford, who's dealing with that finger still. Lions locker room, though, has a little us against the world mentality with not a lot of people giving them a chance to win in Seattle. The Russell Wilson, he makes things go. Uh, Baldwin's doing a great job as usual. They got a tight end. That's a, a nightmare to match up with. Um, you know, they, they do they do things well. Their special teams is tough to handle, you know. Um, so, um, you know, I, still an outstanding football team. There's a reason why year after year after year they're, they're uh, one of the 12 teams still working this time of year. Uh, the Lions handling a running quarterback and a tight end. All right, maybe things will change. <laughs> Next Saturday right here on Local 4, kickoff is at 8.15. Lions and Seahawks, Seattle the early eight-point favorite. We've got you covered all week up to the game and after. As we say, Jamie, Jamie will be on the road with the Lions. It'll all start with the 6 o'clock newscast. And Ben, Devin, Kim, and Bernie will be here for that. I hope I didn't break that to you guys just now. <laughs> We're going to say what? Wait. <laughs> Wait. Sorry, Dev. Not many heads hanging in Kalamazoo, nor should they be after Western Michigan dropped the Cotton Bowl 24-16 to Wisconsin. A huge season for the Broncos and P.J. Fleck, who as of now, staying as the head coach for Western. So where does he think his team can row the boat to next year? Now, I'm not saying we're going to be in the national title talk next year, but we have to take the next right step, and that's by upgrading our recruiting, upgrading our facilities, continue to take our program from where it is, and take the next right step. You saw the crowd out there. I mean, if some of you don't even think there's a Kalamazoo, Michigan that exists, there's 150,000 people within a six-mile radius of Kalamazoo. It's a fabulous little town. you got to come out and see it. We're going. It, it is a fabulous little town. A little fact check. It's actually 75,000 people, but oh, neither here nor there. They got the air zoo there. It is. Yeah, get to They, they acquitted Great themselves candy. really nicely against a very quality opponent, obviously. They very well did. So, Much more coming up in the lines at six. Yeah. We'll hear from Matt Stafford oh. on that finger. All right. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. And the big cool down coming. Yes. I, I want to talk about the lines, too, because oh, okay. weather is going to be. Yes, it is. This time around. <laughs> this is not going to be inside. <laughs> Maybe it'll help us. Bernie would say. Uh, and we're watching a system that's going to be coming in off the Pacific Coast. Uh, I wouldn't be too hung up on the timing of this, but it looks like it is going to be late Saturday into Sunday. This is Detroit time, by the way, so we will be seeing some showers push onto the Pacific Coast. The question is, can we hold them off until after the game? There's going to be a ton of rain across California. Good news there. Of course, they've still got that tremendous drought down there, so uh, they're going to get soaked from some of that system. But we hope it'll stay out of the state of Washington, at least for the game on Saturday. Back home, speaking of rain, we're starting to see a little bit more line up along this cold front, but some pretty heavy rain 
running across the northern end of the area. In fact, right there coming in on parts of Sanilac County, some uh, heavy rain expected there as uh, we get to the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes. 23 for the overnight low tonight and uh, we'll see that rain. Then it will start turning colder. Some of that may turn to a light mix before it actually dries out. But that's the average line and we're nowhere near it for the next five days into the 20s for highs. Wind chills will be in the single digits to close out the week. Ooh. Here's today's Hanson's weather window and the fog was out today. This is out on Woodward. We had a if that could be Seattle. Could be. Yeah, we're getting ready. <laughs> it's looking that way. Isn't it? Sort of getting the lines prepared mentally for that. Uh, we did have a dense fog advisory out that expired at four. So visibility is coming up a bit, but it's still going to be a little wet tonight for the drive home. Not to move in on Ben's turf, but this year there is going to be less snow in Plymouth Township, though it has nothing to do with the weather. Ahead of 530, what the township is selling that one official says is nothing but a money pit. But first, a baggage handler ends up taking a bizarre, in fact, dangerous ride that has police stumped. We'll have that story next. Coming up Wednesday on Local 4 News Today, from nice to ice. Ah. I'm tracking some really cold, windy changes. We've got your weather and traffic always on the force. Also tomorrow, if you're trying to lose weight, at 5.50 a.m. for Wellness Wednesday, Dr. George has four strategies to help you avoid overeating involving one that includes your phone. We'll tell you more about that, plus all the top stories to get your day started. Join us tomorrow morning from 4.30 to 7 a.m. She says she United Airlines baggage handler is reportedly not saying how he ended up locked in a plane's cargo bay and survived a nearly 90 minute flight. The small United Express jet flew Sunday from Charlotte, North Carolina to Washington, D.C. The plane reached an altitude of 27,000 feet, but the cargo hold was pressurized during the flight. Police in Washington at first thought he was a stowaway. The baggage handler did not suffer any injuries. Okay, so would you like to buy a snowmaking machine described as ski resort quality? How could you pass that up? Plymouth Township may have just what you're looking for. Back in 2015, Township okayed spending more than $20,000 for a snowmaker. It was used to make snow for a small sledding hill in a township park, but critics said it was a huge waste of money. Some of those critics won Township posts on the November election, so now Plymouth Township is looking for a buyer of the machine. You know how much fun you could have with practical jokes? With your jokes? own snow blow? Oh, Like you could absolutely. just like go to your neighbor's yard and just, oh. Or go to the school superintendent's morn yard the morning of, you, you know, day, when you want a school day. day just, you just need 20,000. Right uh, holidays, of course, are times for family reunions, but the scene New Year's Eve in Amarillo, Texas was a long time coming. A man met his birth mother 55 years after she put him up for adoption. Edward Montano was and his wife spent years researching his past and even used DNA testing. Well, they located his mother, who was homeless when she had to put him up for adoption. Saturday, Edward and Mary Ellen Day met, embraced, and tried to put emotions into words. Last night, I slept. The first time I can remember, I slept without dreaming. God brought him back to me in his own time. Sometimes you wish it would have been sooner, sometimes later. Mm -hmm. The reunion had an added significance because Sunday was Edward's 55th birthday, which I'm sure she remembered. Pretty great. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Local 4 News at 6 is next. Let's get back over to Kim and see what's coming up in our next 30 minutes. Kim. And Devin, good evening to you. We're working on stories from Southfield, Macomb County, South Lyon, and your community. But first, a viral video prompting awareness of the dangers of falling furniture. What you can do to keep your kids safe. Nick? And a deputy, a male deputy inside of the Wayne County Jail filing a lawsuit against the county and saying that a female sergeant has been sexually harassing him for almost a year. They were pretty explicit of what she wanted to do to him and what he, she wanted him to do to her. The explicit and the uncomfortable things that she allegedly sent to him. 